a message. Um, right, so maybe you will see that message. Uh, all right, well, welcome to class, well, the last class for April. Um, so we we doing well on in terms of you know keeping up with the syllabus and, and completing well covering all the topics properly and um completing everything on time. So we have we have a few classes remaining, but we'll schedule things properly. Um, so we're doing well on time and everything. So we reach presentation ten out of thirteen. Um, I think. 11 and 13 I want to split 11 because it's, it's a lot of topics here to cover and then 13 because it's a completely new area um, but I will cover the 10 and 12 should be fairly okay um, right so before we start 10 um, last class we went through well we started um, seriously looking at a lot of IP services right so we had started not um, the week before, and we said that NAT or network address translation is uh, a method for people to access the internet. Basically, you take a private IP address and you use hosts that are um, addressed with any IP address in the private space, usually, um, and then you translate those private addresses to public addresses. Um, and the big advantage of it is that you can set up giant pools of private addresses and use you know, one or two, or, or just a small pool of public IPs. Um, and there isn't really a recommendation for how large you could go. Um, different guides say different things, but you could usually get in a range of a few thousand private IPs sharing a single public IP. Um, so it has helped, um, I think somebody else right, nice. Um, so it has helped um, alleviate the, the IPv4 public address shortage problem a lot. Um, so after that, we went on to discuss NTP, which is Network Time Protocol. Um, and we said that NTP is basically essential to synchronize clocks across um, our entire network. Um, whether it's routers, switches, firewalls, servers, everything. We want everything perfectly in sync so that we could um, set up a timeline of events. So in, in the configure and verify NTP, I showed you the, the actual commands um, to set up NTP. But of course, the, the larger bit here is we want to set up NTP and we want to make sure that all our time sources are in sync because we want to know if anything goes wrong, we could follow the logs. We could say um, the router went down at this time, but before the router went down, um, we had a link failure um, on the router, which was due to a failure on a switch, which was due to a failure on the uplink provider, uh, and we could kind of um, put a timeline of events because that is what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, something will go wrong. Uh, whether it's a security attack, whether it's a network problem, whatever it is, something will go wrong. Um, and then we will need to write a report. We will need to troubleshoot and we will need to investigate. And NTP will help us um, correlate everything. So we want to make sure um, want to make sure that NTP is, is synced. And I, I gave you the verification commands too. So you could either just do a show clock and make sure the time is correct, or do the show NTP status on all of those things um, and make sure the NTP will get on all of the devices. Um, then we went through DHCP and DNS. So I said DHCP is the dynamic host configuration protocol. And it's basically the, the protocol that we use um, to assign IP addresses dynamically on a network. Rather than going into every single device and punching the IP address manually, um, DHCP just hands out IP addresses from a central pool. Whereas DNS is used to resolve host names. So like this here, learning network.cisco.com. This is nice and easy for us to remember. Um, if somebody tells you, go to learning network.cisco.com, you could come and type that in very easily. Um, whereas if they tell you go to 104.253.1.10, it is a lot more difficult to get. Um, but machines can't process this. Machines don't know how to connect to this directly. So DNS performs a resolution um, and I gave you some examples of, of some commands you could use to see that resolution in real time, either NSLOOKUP or DIG. Um, and you could see what, what hostname maps to which IP. So what server, does, um, what server does your machine actually connect to when you type this in in your browser? 
uh, and that's the role of both of those principles. That's the main thing we focused on there. Um, and then we went through the function of SNMP in network operations. So I told you that SNMP is the simple network management protocol. It's basically used um, to get values off of our network devices. So um, like a router, a router will have a bunch of useful info um, that we want to collect. We want to collect temperature, we want to collect fan speed, input voltages, um, what else? Bits per second, you know, the, the speed that it is operating at. Um, so we could tell when we need to operate a link, um, if we see any errors on the interfaces, uh, all, all sorts of things. And we went through the MIB and the OIDs. Um, and if you ever need to play with SolarWinds or OpenNMS or CAPT or anything, um, you'll become a, a lot more familiar with SNMP. Um, so all we're interested in for this version of the syllabus is the function of SNMP which is basically the same thing I just told you. Just pull in data from devices, or in some rare cases, you could also set some values to configure devices, but we don't usually do that. Um, then we went through the use of syslog features, including facilities and levels. Um, so we went through basically what a syslog message looks like, um, what the, the different levels are, and what happens when you configure a certain level. Remember, you have um, a bunch of different levels that could help you control how many messages you have coming to your syslog server. Um, so you might want to configure, you know, somewhere in the middle so that you get the important messages, but you don't get flooded with too many information, well, too much data that will fill up your servers and, and your storage drives way too quickly. Um, and any facilities are the different processes that send data um, using syslog. So make sure and memorize the different levels. Um, I, I've never seen them actually different facilities. Just get familiar with the facilities um, in the, well, in some examples, but really the levels are what they test here. Um, and then lastly, we went through DHCP clients and relay configurations. So the, the client config was very easy. It was IP address DHCP, I believe. Um, the relay was a bit more advanced, but it, the concept was fairly simple, right? The, the configuration was just one command and the concept is basically you take, um, a request coming in on one network and you relay it across to a DHCP server. And this is a feature that is actually used in networks um, as well as it may seem. It is a feature that is used because it is much easier to manage uh, a bunch of giant pools on a on a single um, DHCP server in the network than setting up DHCP servers you know, on every single network that is set up. Um, so, so make sure you understand the configuration and verification of these things. Um, and, and the concepts, of course. So we today we're going to continue uh, our trend, I guess, of going through just a bunch of different useful services on the network. Um, and because we have so many for, for so little percentage, it, it may seem overwhelming. So just try to keep up and, and let me know if you lost anywhere in the middle. Right. Uh, one second. Why are you not loading? Yeah, there we go. Point. Uh... All right. So today we're going to go through um, QoS quality of service, and then configuring devices for SSH, and then the functions of TFTP and FTP, and then we're going to start security, which is the fifth module. Um, these these will be very non-technical. It'll basically be um, concepts because that's that's what they want us to do. Um, nothing technical at all. We can't really configure security concepts. So, on to the first section. So, many enterprises purchase WAN links from ISPs or internet service providers. They use these links to connect to their internal network, um, to connect their internal network to the wider internet, to other branches, or to partner networks. So, that's what WAN links are used for. Remember, we, we mentioned WANs uh, and YLANs. Um, so, those are the internal networks. And to connect outside, we use WAN links. So due to the high cost of these WAN links and the comparative low cost of LAN links, there's often a mismatch in speed between the internal network of an enterprise and the external WAN link or links. Um, so this is why, for example, in your home network, um, the links of your modem might be 100 megs or a gig, um, but your, your WAN speed or your WAN circuit might be limited to 40 megs or, or 25 megs or, or something much lower. Um, you can see that in, in your own house. I mean, you could put it up to 100 megs or, or these days even a gig, but it's very expensive, right? So you don't usually see that. So there's usually a mismatch 
between your internal network and your external network in, in terms of speed or bandwidth. In situations with mismatched speed such as this, application performance may suffer due to congestion or overloading on the WAN link, resulting in dropped or delayed packets in the router connected to the WAN. So basically, what we're saying here is, imagine you're trying to pull uh, a 4K stream from Netflix through your modem. Um, somewhere in your modem, your, your provider limiting you to 25 megs, and um, in your LAN, you have a lot of bandwidth. In your LAN, if you, if you had a, a Netflix server in your house, you could stream you know, at a full gig to a Netflix server. But over that one link, you're going to lose a lot of speed, right? Because you have a, a 25 meg connection or a 40 meg connection or whatever it is. So somewhere, that 25, connect, 25 meg connection is going to max out and you're going to have congestion or overloading. So quality of service or COS is a set of techniques used to manage situations such as this, allowing us to configure different classes of service for different applications and thereby allowing us to maintain a certain minimum acceptable quality in different network applications. So basically with COS, what we do is um, we, we set up classes. Uh, think of classes as groups for different types of traffic. So staying with our Netflix example, we may know that Netflix, you know, uh, maybe mom watches Netflix um, every Saturday night or, or every seven o'clock, um, seven o'clock in the evening is always running. Um, but at the same time, uh, maybe your dad or maybe somebody else has to have a VoIP call or a WhatsApp call. Um, for a business, and that is very important, and you, you don't want to let Netflix, um, you know, make that call suffer. You don't want to allow Netflix to make that call suffer. So you could classify your traffic and say um, that any traffic that comes across as a call, make that super high priority. Don't don't let that suffer at all. The Netflix traffic, let it suffer a little bit. It might need to buffer, but that's fine. So that's what quality service allows. So several key metrics are typically used to define application performance over the network. Bandwidth, which is the speed of the links between the sender and receiver, usually in bits per second or megabits per second or gigabits per second. One-way delay, which is how long packets take to get from a sender to a receiver, measured in milliseconds. Two-way delay, which is how long packets get, um, take to get from a sender to a receiver and then come back in milliseconds. Jitter, which is a variation in one-way delay, for consecutive packets in milliseconds, and then packet loss, which is a percentage of packets lost from a sender to a receiver in percentage. Um, so, so these units, you can change them, but these are the usual um, base units for these things. So when we when we try to quantify networks and measure you know, network quality, these are the things that people usually quote. They say, this network is very good because it has a packet loss that is below 0 0.001%. Or our data is always less than 10 milliseconds, um, which is why we could charge you $5,000 a month for that link. Um, or you need a, a really low one-way delay or a really low two-way delay for some reason. We could guarantee you that, but you need to pay $10,000 a month. Right? Just as an example. Uh, we, we know about bandwidth. Bandwidth is the, the most quoted, um, well, the most quoted quantity of, of all of these, or the most quoted KPI. Um, when you when you buy a link from Flow or from Digicel or TSCT, they tell you you can get a link with up to 25 megs or up to 100 megs um, in bandwidth. Now, different network applications respond differently to variations in these key metrics. For example, increases in one-way delay above 150 milliseconds has been shown to degrade the quality of voice over well voice over IP or void calls. Similar degradations were seen when jitter was increased beyond 30 milliseconds or loss was increased above 1%. However, little degradation was noticed when bandwidth was restricted due to low bandwidth requirements for VoIP calls. So, so this is a, a very popular problem and it is a, a thing you'll hear a lot of network engineers complain about. Um, as residential customers, when we buy links, we only see bandwidth, right? Um, people compare links or, or compare packages by bandwidth. But a lot of services really don't care about bandwidth. I mean, if you take, um, well, well, in this case, um, I can't remember where I pulled this data from. It was a Cisco textbook or something. Um, but, but I have seen it in a lot of other cases. If you take a link that is a meg and a link that is a gig and you, you do VoIP calls over it, you see um, basically the same performance in, in terms of speed. But when you start to vary other things like jitter um, or packet loss or, or latency, well, one way delay, you see a lot more um, difference in the calls, so you notice it a lot more. Um, just as an example, 
if you ever had a call where um, you, you say something and then you have to wait, like you have to literally stop talking and pause and wait for the other person to hear what you said and then say something and for it to get back to you, um, you will notice that a lot more than if their voice quality drops. Because actually, we most of our calls take place in 64 kilobits per second, uh, and we don't even know. Um, because we, we just don't care for that higher bandwidth. 64 kilobits per second. Um, so yeah, all these other metrics play a, a much larger role than, than bandwidth. So based on these observations, you can now understand why it would make sense to classify traffic and treat different classes or applications differently at certain hops or routers on a network. Based on these different classes, we can then place traffic in different buffers, which are just temporary storage places for packets, so that routers can treat them differently during transmission across these slower HOAN links. So basically what we're saying here is, um, because these VoIP calls or, or whatever it is, whatever type of traffic we want to prioritize, because this is so important and it actually doesn't affect um, the other applications that much, we're going to reserve um, or prioritize certain applications or certain classes of traffic over others, um, just to make sure that these, these applications get what they need and they get their high priority across the network so that they could continue to operate properly, even when other applications trying to, to starve them out, basically. So, so there's the, the chain, I guess uh, we can say. It. There's the, the quality of service chain. So you have a packet coming in, uh, router one wants to forward it, um, but it's not just gonna you know, come in and go out. With, with costs, we're gonna make it a bit more complicated. So we're gonna bring in our traffic and we're gonna classify it. And you can think of the, classif the classifications as colors. So maybe you have a, a gold color, a silver color, and a red color. Um, it, it could be like gold, silver, and bronze. It could be green, blue, red, whatever. You can name your, class, your classes, whatever you want. Um, and then based on those classifications, we could put them into different queues. And then we could schedule those queues before we transmit. So maybe we can say, Google priority traffic um, is going to be classified based on whether it's WhatsApp traffic, for instance. Anything that is classified as WhatsApp is put in this, this gold classification here. And we're going to put it into this special high priority queue here. And anything that reaches in here, we're going to stop pulling packets from here. And we're going to pull it out immediately. We don't want any delay here. Um, because this WhatsApp traffic is super high priority on our network. Uh, and we decide this. This isn't predefined. We say, um, well, we, we set up this whole chain, basically. We say um, these are our high-paying customers or, or these are our high-priority applications, and we want these queues to be scheduled or prioritized more than these queues. Yeah? Uh, right, no questions yet. So the quality of service process begins with classification of the traffic. We can configure traffic to be classified based on a number of parameters, such as source IP address, source, pro source port, or protocol. For example, if we know that the VoIP phones in an enterprise all use IP addresses from a particular subnet, we can easily classify VoIP traffic as all traffic master in source IPs from that subnet. So, so that's a common thing. If you, if you assign IP addresses for your phones from a particular network, you could just classify that network and say everything in that network is high priority because all of those are phones. Once the traffic has been classified by a switch or router, it then needs to be marked so that downstream routers or switches can identify it as well. Marking is the process by which a particular header value is set according to a scheme agreed upon by the engineer. The most common header utilized for marking is the differentiating service, differentiated service co services code points or DSCP field, also called the traffic class bytes in IPv6. Since the IP header is not changed during the life of a packet, this mark remains throughout the network. Well, so certain parts of the IP header are not changed for the life of a packet. You have certain things like TTL that, that are changed. Um, but usually the IP header is not changed. Like your IP address and stuff doesn't change. Um, so basically what I'm saying here is you don't want you don't want to be doing this classification in every single router, right? It is, it is a very expensive task. Um, so basically it will add in a lot of delay um, to your network if you do this a lot of times. So all you do is on the first router, you classify it and you say, look, this is WhatsApp traffic. I'm going to assign a special tag to this to say, well, to tell the other routers downstream that, hey, this is WhatsApp traffic. Don't bother to recheck it. I already check it and it's WhatsApp traffic. Um, so, so don't waste time rechecking it. That's what this um, this, classif this marking is, sorry. So we mark it and we say, hey, this is WhatsApp traffic. I pay in my mark on it and saying this is WhatsApp traffic. 
Note that other headers such as the EXP field in MPLS and the uh, COS field in 802.1 QFrames can also be used for marking. So you could use a, a bunch of different fields um, in your headers in, in different layers to mark. It all depends on you. You set up this scheme in your network. Also note that we need to define trust boundaries for accepting DSCP headers. For example, we may not want to trust DSCP markings from end user devices, as users may figure out the high priority DSCP values and abuse the system. We thus define a trust boundary, which defines the portion of the network in which DSCP values are trusted. So just as an example, we have an end host here, we have a switch here with a trust boundary, um, and we, we put our trust boundary here, and we say anything after this, we trust. Anything before this, we don't care. Um, we want this switch to set the DSCP and the COS inbound, uh, basically to, to do the marking now, because this guy could figure out that we we prioritizing um, maybe DSCP uh, 67. This is an example. It, it's, it's a bunch of random codes, but maybe we set the DSCP 67, uh, and this guy figures out that 67 is high priority stuff, um, and it will always get the best bandwidth and the, the lowest latencies and stuff. So maybe for his game traffic. He tries to set all the traffic there as 67, um, just to get you know high priority stuff on your network. But because we define this trust boundary here now, we say nah. Um, whatever you set for the DSCP field, I'm gonna just discard that and, and make it blank again, and I'm gonna set my own DSCP based on my examination of this traffic, my classification of this traffic. So so I hope you understand why we need that trust boundary there. There are many guidelines to aid us in choosing what exact DSCP values to use for different classes of traffic. RFC 4594, which is this, is one such guideline. Note that our traffic has been classified. Note that yeah, our traffic has been classified as marked once. Once traffic has been classified as marked, we can implement queuing on our nodes. Oh no, that's our traffic. Um, queuing allows us to prioritize certain classes of traffic over others by placing different classes into different buffers then using a scheduler to intelligently select packets from different buffers to forward out at different rates. So, so this is what I was saying with your buffers before. So we classify the traffic. We know this is WhatsApp traffic, um, maybe this is Skype traffic, and then this is every other traffic. So it goes into different queues. WhatsApp traffic, high priority. This is like the highest priority. As soon as something comes in, send it out. Um, you have a little lower priority, and you are the lowest priority. Uh, that's not Right, so I, would have to, I know most of you would have missed the message at the start. Um, my dad had to set up some Zoom meetings and stuff, so I had to help him out with that. Uh, you should be good there. Um, right, cues. So, yeah. Okay, go back. Mm -mm -mm. Right. Yeah, so once we classify our traffic into different, well, different groups or different classifiers, we put them into different queues and say, um, scheduler, you, you should serve this queue the most then this one the second most, and this one last. So if you have no packets here, then go here. So maybe this will be like the Netflix traffic, or, or all other bulk data transfers like FTP and, and torrents and stuff. Um, this might be like Skype or online games and stuff, and this will be our web calls, just as an example. Yeah.
Oh, sorry. Yeah, Amino. Yeah, I think I forgot to unmute before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes. People back and forth to different meetings and stuff. Um. Right. So I think I think I have it in the next slide. Right. So I was saying. Um. Uh, wait. I didn't read the slide before. Yeah. So different types of queuing result in different levels of performance for classes of traffic. Two examples of queuing types are the round robin queuing method, which basically cycles through each class buffer in turn, and the low latency queuing method, which prioritizes traffic in certain buffers over the others. Depending on your application requirements, you would choose to implement one type over the other. So, so there's the, the gist of it, right? We, we finish with the classification. We have our application put into different groups based on you know what types of application they are or what subnets they're coming from. And now we want to say, um, how do we queue it? So we have like a round robin queuing. So round robin means um, by default, like a default round robin would be if you have four queues or four memory stages where we store in packets, then pull one from here, pull a one from here, one from here, and one from there. You're like you're basically going to all in turn. That's why I have the round here. So go to each one of these in turn and pull one. Um, but you, you could adjust this as well. So you could say pull 50, well, spend 50% of your time here. 10% of your time there, 15% of your time there, and 25% of your time there. So you could say in every one second, wait 500 milliseconds and take packets out from here. Wait 100 milliseconds and pull packets from here. Wait 150 milliseconds and, and keep going like that, right? Um, so that's that's like a modified round robin. But by default, you just take one, 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 and you keep going. Or take equal amounts. Like this might be like 25, 25, 25, 25 here by default. Um, and then the, the low latency queuing, so LLQ is low latency queuing here, is to implement low latency. So as a as an example, like what I was describing before, voice is super sensitive to latency um, or to, to one, one way latency or, or one way delay. So you might want to say um, all our WhatsApp traffic is going to come into this queue and this will always be next. So as soon as um, a packet comes in here, this, this scheduler will go and pull this packet out. And the scheduler will say, hey, um, anytime you get a packet, notify me, and I will take out this packet and send it out and transmit it one time. Um, and for the other guys, I'll just round robin them. I'll spend equal amounts of time and just keep serving them. But whenever you get a packet, just come on and I'll pull it out immediately. So that's the different types of schedulers we could implement. Um, so so just to stay with, with the context here, we're just going through the different stages in this whole quality of service process. So quality of service is a is a big long chain of events and we're going through the different stages now. So now let's introduce two other tools related to quality of service, policing and shaping. Both these tools are used to keep the bandwidth of a link to a particular configured value. We load the line rates for that link. This value is often called the committed information rate or CIR. For example, either of these tools could be used to keep a one gig line speed link at a CIR of approximately 200 megs. So just as an example, maybe you have a fiber to the home connection at home and your fiber to the home connection could do a gig or 2.5 gigs or, or 10 gigs. Um, but your, your ISP can't afford to give everybody that speed, right? So what they'll do is they may implement a, a policer or a shaper and sell packages well below that rate. So they might sell a package that is 200 megs and this, this policer or this shaper will make sure that you can't cross 200 megs on that link, even though the link could physically um, sustain a gig. So these tools are often used by service providers to enforce the speeds that their customers are paying for, right? Just to source that. So let's examine policing first. Policing tools periodically sample the bandwidth or incoming bit rates of a link and compare that bandwidth to the configured policing rate. If the con incoming um, bit rate ever exceeds the configured policing rate, the policer drops the excess packets until the policing rate is achieved. Policing tools usually allow for a particular boost value, which may allow a customer to exceed the, the configured policing rate for a small amount of time. So we have a graph for this, don't worry. So this is what we're gonna do, right? We this is our incoming traffic. So maybe we're going up to, you know, we let's say we have a, we have a 200 meg package. Maybe we're going up to 300 megs or 400 megs. Uh, we we drop it down and then we go back up and we cross in 200 megs again. The policing rate is going to be applied to that, and we're going to do this. We're going to flatten it out. We're going to say, um, you're going up 100 megs, uh, 150 megs, no problem. Once you start crossing that 200 megs, we're going to drop out all the packets. So all the packets that were on top here, they got dropped. And, and your actual speed would be around that 200 mark there. 
if you drop below that, no problem. As soon as you try to go back up there, it will drop it again. Um, now the, the difference here would be this burst rate. So what a burst rate is, is we say, okay, um, this is t equals zero and this is t equal one. Um, we're gonna allow you to burst above your 200 megs for 0.1 seconds. So if you just load a web page and you cross that 200 megs just by loading this web page, as long as you load it very quickly and you stop, no problem. We, we will allow that. We won't drop any packets. Um, but if you try to do this and you try to sustain it above that, um, then we're going to say, nah, bad luck. You got to drop your, your packets there. Um, and this makes a big difference in user experience. Um, people like to load web pages uh, very quickly and then they kind of drop off after that now. Um, so th it might be like this. You load a web page here and then you, you're reading through a web page. You're, you're watching your Facebook posts and stuff. Um, so you're not using any bandwidth after that. So that, that boost rate helps improve the user experience a lot. Now, shapers, on the other hand, approach the issue from a different angle. Rather than dropping the excess packets, shaper at, shapers attempt to add the excess packets to another queue. These packets can then be outputted from this excess queue whenever the output link, outgoing link becomes less congested. This can be beneficial in applications where little to no loss is required. However, shapers typically add a lot of delay to the traffic. So, so this is what we're saying, right? We have our queues here, just as normal. Remember we did the classification and then the queue and all of that. Um, then we're going to shape. We're going to say, okay, um, take the output of all of these queues and look at whatever shape rates we have configured here and then put it into our next queue um, or our next set of queues. Uh, yeah. Seeing somebody, not Trisha Leaf. All right, hope, hope all this will handle there. Um, Right, so yeah, we have a next queue here. So we have these queues here initially, but we have a next queue here. So the shaper, instead of just dropping the packets out, right, is going to put this into this extra queue. And it is going to say, um, okay, I am going to keep these packets and send them out slowly so that the packets do get lost. It's just that we lose the, um, but we, we add delay because it puts in packets into queues always adds extra delay. So, so that's, the, the two ways that we could maintain different speeds um, using quality of service. And of course, it's a big long chain. So take your time and, and go back through the um, chain and make sure you understand all of the steps or all of the hops. So pull hop behavior for quality of service is just different hops in the network. Classification, um, queuing, and then shaping or policing, and then outputs. And the whole point of all of this is just to enforce different types of behaviors. When we have uh, a one meg link going to a hundred meg link, or in our case, a 25 meg link going to a one gig link. Um, whatever we have that, that difference in speed there. Yeah, so there's no configuration, it's just understanding quality of service. So now let's switch gears and return to some management protocols. Throughout this course, we've mentioned two main protocols used for remote CLI access, Telnet and SSH. We've also mentioned that Telnet use is usually discouraged as it transmits information in plain text across the network. This means that anyone who is able to sniff um, and analyze your remote sessions across the network would be able to easily view your username and passwords. So don't use Telnet. We always said that. A much more secure solution is to utilize the secure shell or SSH protocol. The first step towards enabling SSH on a device is to ensure that the device has access to a database of credentials for users. This database can be a local database on the device or a remote database in the form of a TACAX Plus or Radius Silver. So we, we mentioned that before, right? Um, I went through that whole thing with a device will, will query this database and it will send back a response. And the whole advantage of this is that you don't need to create users on every single device. Um, but it is a bit more difficult to set up. So I'll just show you the setup for a local database now. So to create users on the local database, we use the config configuration mode command Username X secret Y or password Y, but as you know, secret is, is much safer than password. So username X secret Y, where X is the username of the user that we want to create, and Y is the encrypted password, which is what the secret does. The second step involves configuring the device to actually use this local database of users for authentication using the command line command line VTY 015. So on most Cisco devices, it'll be 015. Um, so line VTY 015 followed by the command login local. So that login local command tells the, the router or the switch, um, use my local database of users for your access. 
um, and the line BTY0515 is your virtual terminal, so your, your SSH or your Telnet, um, like your virtual console cables coming into the device. Not an actual console cable, a virtual console cable. While we're here in the sub-configuration menu, we will use the command transport input SSH to only allow SSH remote access to the virtual terminal lines. Um, so transport input, and then if you put a question mark after here, you will see usually you have a bunch of options, right? Um, Telnet and SSH will be included in that. If you want to say um, we only want to allow SSH, then we put transport input SSH, and it only allows SSH. So it is the is the configs here. Username Rishi, secret Rishi. So my username here, my password here. Line VTY is zero, and you put a question mark just to see how many virtual lines you could allow in this device. Um, and you see the maximum there is 15. So you put zero to 15 to cover all of them. So line VTY is zero 15, and then you press enter. And then we, we get into those, uh, to configure all those lines, just like we could do an int range and configure multiple interfaces. We could configure multiple lines like this. And we put login local to check this local database of username and passwords. And then transport input SSH to only allow SSH input through these VTY lines. Now let's configure the encryption keys that our device requires to support SSH. The generation of these keys requires the host name and the FQDN or the domain name to be set on the, on the device. So we set these parameters using the command host name and the host name of the device and IP domain name, and then the domain name of the network. We then actually generate these keys using the command crypto key generate RSA. We will then be prompted to select the key size. Choose a number larger than 768 bits um, to support SSH v2. So every, every modern device uses SSH v2, not v1. So we always want to use SSH v2. So you see here, um, put in the host name, host name R2, or whatever is the name of the device, and then IP domain name, and uh, mynetwork.com or maybe digital.com, whatever it is, whatever domain name you want on your network. And then crypto key generate RSA. Uh, and you can just press put the enter there if you want. Um, you will get this warning if you already um, defined keys. In my case, I changed the host name there. So you see the R1 there. I changed the host name to R2. So I want to replace these keys. So I'll put yes. Um, and then you see the name for the keys will be r2.domainname.com. We want that. Then choose the size of the key modulus from 360 to 2048. Um, you could choose the largest if you want, 2048. It will be the, the hardest to crack, um, but it will take a while to generate. Um, you want to choose anything higher than 768 um, to, to get SSH v2. So in this case, I choose 1024. And, and that's it. Um, SSH v1 uh, version 1.99, so you see here, SSH 5 enabled, SSH 1.99 has been enabled. Um, so there's no SSH 1.99, right? Um, it just means that the device will support both SSH v1 and v2. If we want to force the device to use SSH v2, which is the more secure version, we can use the command IP SSH version 2. And as it, we can now use a remote SSH client like Putty to SSH to our device over the network, as long as the device has an IP address configured on it. Uh, uh, we have done this, I can't remember if we do it in class, we did the console cable, um, but in Putty, I have that SSH option there, um, by default is port, is CCP port 22, um, which you'll see on Putty, and then you just put the IP address next to it, and you get into it, um, with that same username and password. Um, yeah, so that is configuring devices for SSH, and um, now one, well, one, a last set of protocols, we, in order to understand how we can manage our devices remotely, let's discuss how we can transfer files remotely to one from our devices. The Trivial File Transfer Protocol, or TFTP, and the File Transfer Protocol, or FTP, are two protocols widely used in networks to manage file transfers. Both protocols allow us to transfer multiple files of any type to one from our device's flash memory, which is the storage in our infrastructure devices. So our routers and switches, they have flash memory. One common use for these servers is to transfer new iOS images to our devices during the upgrade process. So Cisco's operating system is, is usually called iOS for the, the older devices. Um, there is also some Nexus stuff, uh, so NXOS and iOS XE and iOS XR. And there are a bunch of different things, but iOS is usually the, the one three older devices that we work with. So you see here, 
um, we want to download, well, we, we downloaded a file from the internet, uh, an OS upgrade to the TFTP server, and now we want to copy something from the TFTP server to our flash memory to upgrade the device. So we go in the router and put copy TFTP flash, which means copy from the TFTP server to our flash server, um, flash memory, sorry. Then they ask us for, for a bunch of different things here. So address or name of remote host, um, we put in that, so that's, that's telling us was the, the address of the remote server, um, the TFTP server. Then the source file name, so what is the, the file name that we want to copy? And then destination file name, so we could keep the same name and just press enter there. Um, and once you press enter there, you see accessing TFTP at this IP, and this is the, the file that we want to access. And you'll see loading via this interface, and it'll just keep putting up estimation marks here slowly as it's downloading the device. This is its progress bar. Um, and whenever it finishes, you'll see OK, and the, the file size, so you see this is a, a fairly large file. Um, so you have to keep an eye on your, um, on your memory size, because a lot of these devices don't have a lot of memory. Um, so it'll, it'll give you a speed and your bytes copied and stuff. And that was it. We, it was fairly easy, right? We had like what one, two, two things to enter after the command. So it's one command and then two things to enter. Are we done? Now compare that to the, the, the TFTP transfer to the FTP transfer below. So you see copy FTP uh, and there's the author of the textbooks. Um, then the IP address of the server, uh, we, we put in his username and password here, right? And then the file name and then flash. So it's a, it's a much longer command. And then destination file name there, and then accessing that, and we'll, we'll get the same loading and stuff. Uh, and then it'll finish here. Um, and it'll give you the, the results there. You'll notice that the FTP transfer, unlike the TFTP transfer, includes user credentials in the command. TFTP was designed as a simpler file transfer protocol with reduced features as compared to the fully featured FTP protocol. This makes TFTP a much lighter and simpler protocol to run, but it also means that certain features, such as security features, are lacking. You must therefore decide which protocol to use, depending on your use case. Um, so basically, TFTP is a, is a lighter version of FTP, and it, it lacks a lot of uh, functionality, but it's much simpler to use. So you have to decide which one you value more. For example, another typical use case for FTP or TFTP servers is to back up and restore configuration files from your devices. You may not care if an attacker were to obtain access to your unprotected TFTP server if you only store iOS images on the server. But if your configuration files are typically, um, but, but your configuration files are typically very sensitive files. So just as an example, if you store plain text passwords, your passwords will be in your config files, right? Um, so you don't really want people snooping on your config files and watching um, the output that you show on. So you may thus choose to use FTP servers in this scenario. FTP connections can also be encrypted using the FTPS protocol. Another, another protocol called SFTP was also introduced for encrypted file transfers. So with FTP, we have these secure options, and we also make sure that anybody accessing the server has to put in a username and a password, which is a lot of security by itself. TFTP isn't protected by those username and password requirements. Um, so basically, depending on your use case, you'll choose more security uh, versus more usability. Uh, and that's a common theme in security. So as a last note, we have only mentioned two uses of these file transfer protocols. Where my mouse gone? Okay, not sure where my mouse gone. Yeah, okay. Yeah, mouse being ready. All right. Um, we have only mentioned two uses of these file transfer protocols but there are a large number of other uses for them. You may come across many enterprises using these servers for other network tasks, such as archiving log files, archiving um, SIEM outputs, so we'll get into this in the security section, archiving OS system images or restore points or, or whatever. Um, so depending on how safe we need to make these files, um, you know, how, how risky they are to the business uh, and how simple um, how often we may be accessing these files and these services, we might choose TFTP versus FTP. Right, so that's it. Let me see if I can fix my mouse um, and get some water. Uh, we'll come back at seven. Yeah, yeah, five minutes should be enough. So take our five minutes and we'll come back at seven.